uh, the closed captioned comics legacy panel. Uh, let's explain what that would mean. Uh, so the four people sitting at this table, I wrote on my notes with me today, but I'm not at sitting at the table. Uh, all met at the Maryland Institute College of Art, began publishing under the name Closed Caption Comics close to 10 years ago. Does that seem not too wrong? Yeah, it's, I think that's They right. were all interested in comics, but none of you were illustration majors, correct? Uh, Aaron Womack was, but yeah. Not here. Not here. <laughs> not here. Uh, came to comics, different set of influences and approaches than at the time would be standard or considered traditional. Included in the closed caption comics group are several other artists who could not be with us today, uh, including Lane Milburn, whose book 12 Gems was published by Fanographics a few months ago, and Aaron Womack, who was just mentioned. Oh, wait, we have microphones. Yeah. Is this necessary? Yeah, it is. OK, <laughs> great. Um, so uh, since graduating, each have followed separate paths geographically as well as artistically. But the closed caption comics moniker lived on throughout their through their anthology as recently as uh, a few years ago, like 2009, 2010. Mm -hmm. um, today, I want to talk with them all about community, how they've influenced each other and their own individual artistic processes and pursuits. Uh, here with me now uh, from, I guess, from left to right, is that how you read American comics? Uh, <laughs> that there's Molly O'Connell, uh, who has had pieces of hers appear in the Fanographics <laughs> anthology Beasts, and has work forthcoming in the Graphic Canon anthology, adapting children's literature, where she adapts Carlo Collodi's Pinocchio. Her full-length comic, Difficult Loves, uh, was published by Domino Books, which made her the first CCC artist to have a full-length work issued by another publisher, a fact that Austin English is very proud of. Uh, <laughs> other publications of her include Preguntas, The Jazzlin, and Don't Tell Mom. Uh, she also directed a music video for the band Witch Hat, which included as its membership Noel Freibert, Connor Stuckschul, and Chris Day, uh, and has Lane Milburn as a former member. Uh, then there's uh, Ryan Cecil Smith uh, is over there. Um, Cecil. Cecil, uh, <laughs> who I have not met before. Uh, who's, um, whose comic SF started off as a self-published mini-comic before being picked up by Koyama Press. Uh, he has moved to Japan to teach English after graduating from MICA. He might also be known for his adaptations of the work of um, Matsumoto Leiji, uh, published under the name SF, SF, SF. Uh, SF, SF, two. Okay. A, SF, SF, two, B, and C. Uh, his adaptations of Umezu Kazuo's work, uh, and that's under the name Two Eyes of the Beautiful. Um, then, uh, then we got Noel Freibert, uh, whose work appeared in the Beast Anthology also. Uh, he also has work in Mold Map 3, uh, Insect Bath, Off the Press, and Issue 4 of Happiness. He is the editor and publisher of Weird Magazine, of which there are five issues to date. Other mini comics of his include Prowla, Mr. Seller's Attic, My Best Pet, and Night of the Shears. Uh, then Connor Steck Schultz, uh, comic The it's Amateurs. Steck Schulte. Steck Steck Schulte. Just for the record. Here. Thanks, guys. I don't yeah. care for this. Um, uh, his comic, The Amateurs, was re-released by Fanographics earlier this year, and his follow-up, The Generous Bosom, will have its first installment published by Breakdown Press uh, and debut in a couple months at Comics Art Brooklyn. He's also the publisher of the anthology of pornographic comics Sock, which has included work by the other panelists. Uh, he also has a short story that's going to be appearing in a forthcoming anthology published by Alternative Comics. Other mini comics of his include The Dormitory, Water Phase, and his newest work, uh, Mountain Comic. Um, so uh, this image that we're looking at is, uh, from a, is a flyer made by Noel for a, uh, a release show for CCC8. Um, and uh, this following image is uh, <laughs> of Molly O'Connell in a costume of her own design. At it's that a Halloween sock. Okay. Upside down. Okay. Walking <laughs> the earth. Yeah. Okay. Um, so please change the slide. Okay. Oh. So uh, I think that's a great photo, um, but that's just me. So I sort of wanted to start off uh, talking to everyone individually, but also if anyone has insights to either each other's work or your own process as it relates to the general things I'm asking. Let's start off. Um, so this is the work of Knowles that appeared in Beasts. Um, and this is Mr. Seller's Attic. 
Um, so CCC was just sort of like a publishing concern, and you've now found other publishers that you sort of fit in with their stable. But um, what's interesting about sort of the work where you made your first initial splash, I would say, is that it's very like handcraft oriented. Like uh, obviously in this piece, there's like that's a lot of colors. It seems like a lot yeah, of work put into yeah. that. Uh, and this, uh, there's less colors and just very well done, like separation and blending of them. Um, but uh, I feel like since graduating from school or since moving into things individually, uh, you sort of reduced those aspects. These are the interiors of Mr. Seller's Attic. And then this is a uh, work called Black Color, which is uh, just the, well, it's sort of evident what you're looking at here, right? Um, <laughs> So the old stuff is very object-oriented and craft-focused in a different way. Uh, there's like a sort of generosity to it or like a level of investment. And I wondered how much of that comes from the expectations of school, how much of that was just like what you were excited about at the time. Yeah, I think part of that was like having having the access to those facilities in school. It, like it, it was like, I guess, a lot easier to make like, I don't know, like an eight-color screen print or whatnot. Um, but also like, <laughs> I guess the, the work I was making in school that it kind of like over time, I was like just talking to someone about this, but like I, I was using a lot of colors and like, they're kind of like psychedelic ish looking and people who are like really into like psychedelic drugs would be like really into my work. And, and I, that just like, wasn't a part of my life. So I was kind of like, like, like what is going on here? Like, I don't. I don't relate to this audience, like partly. And yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I guess also like looking at this image, I think um, I kind of just started working at the BMA and I have a huge collection of Matisse's work and just like being forced to like stare at Matisse for like eight hours a day is like, I, I don't know, it kind of like comes out, I feel like in, in this like, it's like painterly like style. Okay, um, so you started doing horror com. Oh, but the other thing is that everyone else, like Ryan and Molly, and also Connor, uh, all of you were doing like really heavy craft oriented work around the same time. Um, and obviously, there's like a change in the school facilities and now their lack thereof. So, does that answer just sort of answer it for you? Or, Ryan, you still do really detailed, like, Rhizograph printing. Uh, yeah, but that's also like, you know, the same that Noel said, like in college, you know, we had, you know, access to screen printing stuff and, uh, you know, the economics of it were way easier for us because like we weren't buying the ink and the emulsion and stuff. So it was, you know, to do that nowadays is a lot harder. Okay. Um, and then now in Japan, like since I happened or I don't, when I, um, like very near where I used to live in Japan was just like a really good Rhizograph shop. So it's just kind of doing what I could with what I, you know, with what was around me. Okay. And uh, some of my stuff is just black risograph because that's all I had, so. Okay. Um, so the other thing I wanted to ask you, Noel, is uh, by your own account, you made your first horror comic in like August 2008, uh, Assorted Liquids, as yeah. a submission for Cootie Cootie, and uh, things have been moving down a dark road ever since. And uh, <laughs> did, and this is the question, did school ending necessitate this shift and no longer free to suckle at the teat of structure. Did you find <laughs> the adult world to be a dark, unforgiving abyss? <laughs> Whoa. I, 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 I want to say yes, but that, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that's quite like how I would have like put it. I, I, th I think partially like the comics I was drawing when I was in school, I felt like they're kind of limited in this way where like I could only like tell certain stories and they weren't like, I don't know. I, I felt like my mind was like, I, I could tell that it, it just like wasn't fulfilling what I wanted to happen. And I, I feel like when I graduated, I started reading a bunch of EC horror comics and also the book um, Cat Eyed Boy by Kazu Umezu. And uh, I don't know. I, I, I felt like just like, because I'm kind of like using the form of like horror genre comics. And it kind of, I, I feel like I just kind of like plugged in this form in a way. So, oh, okay, so that yeah, sort of moves yeah. on to what I wanted to talk about, which is that since then, I would say that you've like sort of moved p 
past horror as a genre, and now it's like more purely about formal elements, uh, and mm. it's colder. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so I wanted to talk to you about Weird Magazine, which <laughs> I know that the initial idea was uh, for you to have other contributors, but you have like the dominant tone, the dominant like overriding voice. This is from a more recent uh, Weird, and I think this is also like a really good demonstration of like your work is like interrogating form and shape. Um, and yeah, so I guess I just wanted to talk to you, but also what's interesting about the most recent Weird is I feel like there's less comics in it. Mm -hmm. um, so just like a more formal, more conceptual art. And I guess I sort of want to talk to you about like that shift is like the next step past horror. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess the, the magazine, I, I guess I, I, it's weird to me that comics are so like far removed from the art world or something like, cause I, I feel like I, I look at and engage with a lot of contemporary art or something. Like I, I think about that stuff as much as I think about comics. So it's like weird to me. I, th I feel like the the magazine in some ways is like the meeting ground of like those ideas or something like in, but like, yeah, presented in a magazine. Um, but yeah, yeah. And initially I, th I think the idea was like, oh, like I'm going to like make my own horror magazine. And it's, it's kind of like turned into something kind of like bleaker than that, like kind of idea even. I don't know. I guess like, a, a huge thing for me was, um, I don't know if you know the, the play called Endgame by Samuel Beckett, but it's, it's like this, um, it, it's like a, it's like a post-apocalyptic play, but it's, it's really funny and it's like, but it, it, everything, it, it's just basically like these people waiting for the world to end and it's, I don't know. Hey, I don't, if you know his work, it's like super minimal and that, uh, that was like kind of like a huge I think affecting like thing for the, the shift. Okay. Um, so, and this is an image from well, map three. Uh, I'm going to ask everybody about like approaches to color at the end, I think. Um, so let's move on to Ryan. Um, or actually uh, a good like segue about both of you is, uh, is so you were just talking about Kazuo Umezu's cat eyed boy and Ryan uh, you've, did two eyes of the beautiful and also uh so i guess if you want to like talk about manga or like your engagement with it just generally just just to each other probably just like just riff <laughs> from like what you've been i don't know i think uh i didn't read hardly any manga before i went to japan and i think sometimes like noel knows more i think you know a lot of manga sort of more than i do lane also reads a lot of manga and um, I think it was just like a new like frontier. It's just a lot of it's just a lot of work that you know we hadn't known before. And so when I went there, like I was when I went to Japan, I was like amazed by this stuff. Like and I found Umezu um, around the same time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know. It's uh it's just really cool stuff that I couldn't believe that it wasn't already more available. Like I was like, how this is so good and so weird. Like why isn't this already big in America? Uh, I don't know. Uh, do you guys read manga a lot? I, I don't really <laughs> read a lot because when I'm in Japan, it's all in Japanese and I struggle to read it. But in America, like you can just go to the library and buy books. Yeah. Uh, it, I mean, it, it was interesting watching you like, I think, go to Japan because I think right before you left, you had made you were working in the post office and you made a comic about working in the post office. Yeah. And then then like right when you got to Japan, I feel like you, you kind of just like plugged into the idea of manga, which is kind of interesting because you I, I remember actually I don't, I don't know if you remember this, but our very first conversation, y you were wearing a uh, fr fro Jim, Froglin, Jim yeah, Jim James Kolchaka shirt. shirt. Oh and, yeah, and had, it, this yeah. is like our freshman year of college, yeah. and and yeah. and I, I just like I didn't know what it was, but I was like, oh, it looks like a comic. So I was like, oh, do you read comics? And you were like, yeah, yeah. And I was like, have you ever read Berserk, which is a manga? <laughs> yeah. And and, and, and I, I I think you were like, oh, like I don't I don't read manga. But it was it was kind of like it, it was just like this moment where because like I, I knew that you hadn't engaged with that stuff, but you just like went to Japan and then like that was there. So you were just like, all right, like I'm here, like I'm I'm gonna like do this, and yeah. I, I think that's like interesting, you know. Yeah. Well, one thing about what you know what I would it's embarrassing to think about how and I I, mean, I I say it to people is like I used to think this is so embarrassing. I used to think that like 
I don't read manga. Like I was like one of those people. So like, I mean, I was, it, like yeah. pe people, I feel like in the last you know I mean? couple of years, it's, that's, that's a rough statement. Sorry. <laughs> I, 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 I feel like, Molly. That's a good I, thing. I said that was a rough statement <laughs> at it, a comics I convention, but I understand I, uh, he's changed his ways. I, 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 I feel like in the last couple of years, like more more Japanese comics have been published where, to a point where people, when they think of manga, they don't necessarily think of like huge glossed over or glossy eyes. But like, you yeah. know, like like ten years ago when we were freshmen, like I feel like if you said anime or manga, it's like there's like this image of a thing and. Yeah, it's, I guess. It's like, if you, if you don't know that, if you I, don't know what's up with it. Yeah, like, I would just say, like, it wasn't my scene. Like, I didn't know about it. And so I was just, like, looking for things that were, like, closer within my scene. And then so when yeah, I went yeah. to Japan, it was just, like, I was just suddenly exposed to a lot of it. And I was just reading it for what it was. And uh, that was a good experience. Yeah, yeah. That actually sort of brings up this other question I wanted to talk to everybody about in terms of... So at the same way that I said that you've, like, CCC was a publishing concern, and now that you've, like, found other publishers like Molly has like a home at Domino Books and I was just thinking about the idea of Ryan you getting to Japan like that stuff even though you're not necessarily like engaging with the makers of that work that's still sort of your community because that's what's around like that's sort of like to the extent that some people can like choose their friends or like curate their influences mm. you being in Japan I mean, it was a conscious decision to like move somewhere far away, you know, and I just wanted to like, I didn't want to stay in Baltimore and I had a few options in Japan. So I was trying to move somewhere new and to curate my kind of atmosphere, sort of like, but no, I wouldn't is, say that my, like, um, I mean, my community didn't change per se because I was still talking to the same, to my same friends, you know, from afar, but, and I wasn't in a com comics community, like a creator's community in Japan. But yeah, I mean, the effort was like to just be exposed to different things. So this is uh, an image from a Cold Heat special that you did with, I guess, layouts by Frank Santoro. Yes, I did. <laughs> so I guess I want to talk to all of, so Frank has like a pretty rigid formal drive and also all of you were students of Brian or Ralph and all of you were, so I guess I just want to talk about like learning comics and school and what, you got out of that like formal or storytelling and what you've like abandoned from that space? Yeah, I think like, I remember, I remember during that time we would all read like the comics, comics blog, like all the time <laughs> and talk about it. And uh, yeah, and like, yeah, we were like reacting to what, what uh, Frank was saying on there, like, you know, good or bad. But I think we all like, I think most of us, took to heart like the ideas about like composition and um like working I know like a lot of us work like seeing like the spread of the page and like thinking about page turns and like the spread of a book as a unit and stuff like that and uh I think all of us took Brian Ralph's class right yeah mm -hmm. and uh that was awesome I mean like for me um I feel like I developed really fast like in that class because you're just forced to make a lot of different comics all the time. What so, would the assignments be like? Uh, I remember like, I think his like classic first assignment is like a two page comic about somebody who's like a castaway and like how they get stranded somewhere and then how they escape. I remember that one. And then do you guys seems, remember seems any like he sort of worked up like from like, like yeah, a two-page thing, and um, to like steadily more complex stuff. Yeah, there was lots of weird stuff too. Like he would give you a sentence, and you had to cut it up and turn that into a, some sort of cohesive piece, but only using the words. There were like weird. I feel like all of the work I made in that class was terrible, mm -hmm. but it was really important to like think on your feet in in a narrative way and in panels, um, even though like. In my own work, I go in and out of that. And he used to, I remember telling me specifically, like, don't listen to me. Like, yeah. <laughs> I don't know what you're doing and keep That's doing true. it. And like, yeah. but that was, yeah, he told me to never read Understanding Comics. He said, <laughs> just like, do you, you're going to make some weird shit. And I don't know. I think the great thing about him was he was a comics guy. If you wanted to like, go down that path with him, he would hold your hand with like a woolen glove. But if you were trying something weird, he would be really open to that too and like breaking the rules. So Brian was 
Yeah. Also, what so were important. everyone's majors? Printmaking, printmaking. General fine arts. <laughs> uh, painting with oh, a concentration yeah. in printmaking. Okay. <laughs> um, all right, so more of Ryan's stuff. Oh, um, basically, these were images that I was going to ask the questions about manga about to you. This is an image from that comic. It's a page. Um, uh, oh, that's a good book. Right, so <laughs> Ryan did this thing uh, on your blog where uh, you did like a best of the year list uh, where you did a little drawings of everything and this is uh, a drawing of Connor's work and before I started talking about Connor's work, I guess I wanted to talk about everybody about what you learn from looking at each other's work or like what you get out of each other. I feel like, yeah, um, <laughs> Also, the, what does everybody think of 12 Gems? It's so, good. Yeah. so good. I read it in a graveyard, and I really recommend it. It's a good experience. <laughs> um, I would say, like, for a long time, um, like, my biggest, like, comics influences were just, like, our friends. And, like, like I, I, I yeah, we were pretty, I, I, at least personally, like, um, during school and stuff, I was, like, I felt pretty insular, but it felt good, like, I was like, oh yeah, all my favorite cartoonists are like my friends. And like, <laughs> that was, it was like an education because everybody's approach was so different. Um, so yeah, I feel like I learned a lot from just like watching what, like being able to see everyone's like development and how they like move from one thing to another. It was like, oh yeah, that's like how you get out of that bind or something or if you're stuck, yeah. Yeah, 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 I guess I, I feel like Cause we were all, we would all like do these like SPX and Mocha, like the shows together too. So it was kind of like, we were all like on the same deadline too. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of like, I don't know, all this like amped up energy and we're, we're all like looking at each other's work and, and like everyone's like really like trying their best or something because of that. <laughs> like it, it, if, if there wasn't, if we didn't have like, I feel like that community at that age, I, I I don't know. Yeah, and also like in a in a good way, it was really competitive. Like you yeah. know, people would raise the bar, and we wanted to meet it. And you're trying to like impress your friends, and like somebody would do something new, and then you'd realize like, oh wait, I can do something like that. Like Molly mm -hmm. would do a huge book, and it'd be like, damn, what? Like, <laughs> damn, like, oh, like you know, <laughs> we would just do different things and like try to you know. Yeah, co competition was re was really important in like a good way, you know, like um Yeah, I think that's like you like what you were saying about like the craft thing. Mm -hmm. I think like that really pushed us like you know, if someone did like a four color yes. screen printed comic, it's like it's going to totally dwarf your like Xerox thin thing on the same table, so you'd be like, "Oh man, I got to <laughs> Gotta bring the heat. Yeah, but but also in terms of craft, like once someone, you know, once a, you know, our group of friends who are trying like slightly different things, when someone does make you realize that something else is possible, you know, like you just wouldn't occur to you to like do something, you know, like that. And once someone does it, it's like, oh, like why am I not, you know, working in this way? Yeah. Um, and that was, uh, yeah, that was cool. Okay. Um, so also in terms of crafts, we can talk a bit more about like comics craft or um, moving towards that sort of stuff. And also uh, this page from the dormitory. Uh, I also know that like, we already sort of talked about for, we already talked about Brian Ralph, but uh, I guess I wanted to talk about like Fort Thunder influence or, um, oh wait, actually, you know what? I'll ask that question at another time. So <laughs> this is a question of somebody looking at pornography, uh, <laughs> which reminds me of the fact that uh, Connor, y you edited, this the you edited sock and uh, so that's all pornographic material and I guess in the same way if you're close personal friends I'm interested in like people's work revealing things about themselves that you as like somebody who sees them every day might find like disturbing or off putting or <laughs> uh, or just yeah or just how you view seeing somewhat like maybe like intimate work from a peer how that like makes you feel or like influences you or how it deepens your friendships yeah well i mean like the impetus at like behind sock like started with um a mini comic that matthew thurber made called bicycle fluids that was like this really hilarious erotic comic that he made and i think it was like 2008 
like his girlfriend went away for like two weeks and so he was like drawing these weird porno comics but they were still like they weren't just like you know uh they were still very specifically matthew thurber comics like you know all of a sudden like some strange yugoslavian man would show up and like put a light bulb in someone's ass or something and uh like that that really excited me in this way with like i feel like what it, uh like what good um erotic work can do is like very similar to what any kind of good art does which is like it'll make you feel less alone about being strange or uh whatever like specific strange thing about yourself that you feel uncomfortable about so i guess like rather than like seeing something that a friend made that's strange and being like, ooh, like, ooh, what's going on with that person? I'm like, oh, thank God, like, they're as, like, weird as me. <laughs> so that's, like, that's kind of, like, what Sock was all about for me. I was like, I'm, like, I feel like these people are, like, as weird as me. Let's see. And, like, would ask them to be in the, in the book. And I was right. <laughs> 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 um, so this is a page from the generous bosom uh, that I feel is real Sammy Harkamy. Oh, yeah. Probably um, so. Yeah. So I guess I wanted to talk about uh, people. So I know you said that for a while that like your biggest influences were your closest friends, but I felt certain that that must be a lie. Yeah. Um, well. but, I did, <laughs> but I also want to talk about uh, sort of entering into a position <laughs> more as your work has like traveled wider um where that can become even more true where people that were just uh influences are now sort of like your peers or like open admirers of your work mm -hmm. um like i know noel you've had like some like positive interactions with sammy where about like feeling on the same page so i guess i just want to ask you about influences and like building relationships with people after seeing their work yeah i mean like coming to coming to spx and like meeting like brian chippendale and christopher forges and stuff like uh many years ago was really really uh inspiring i think for all of us because we were just like you know we would you know we were handing brian our our little mini comics and he's like oh yeah here's like this we'll, we'll trade here's my six color screen print and just like that generosity and that and then like how incredible their work is and stuff um i think that's like uh in a way like what got what, what is like kind of kept me in comics is that like i admired this guy's work from afar and then like met him so quickly and he was so sweet and so generous and um yeah just like i don't know the community aspect of it was like really awesome I also wanted to show this page from the generous bosom that I feel is real free mocky, which oh, I yeah. cause I know that, uh, yeah. they're a publisher you really admire. Uh, and I was thinking about the idea of like, Oh yeah, maybe you just need to like continually be expanding the scope of who you're like trying to speak to. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I feel like, uh, yeah. Whenever I see like the European stuff, I'm always like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was, I think, something we learned actually by working together so young, so influenced by things, was we all had like a Matt Brinkman era, a Ron Regge like era. And but we kind of were confident in each other's work and would say, you know, you'll kind of work out of that and you'll find your voice eventually and your work won't look like. I mean, I think this work is obviously like gorgeous. I'm talking about more our older, older work where it was like rural here's, apparent. Here's one of your older works. Um, <laughs> hey girl, um, <laughs> look at how terrible that scan is. Um, <laughs> this is from your blog. This isn't a scan that I myself did. I don't no, know what I this know, is from, just I saying. Know, <laughs> I know, Brian. All right, I know. Throwing, throwing that out there to the room at large. <laughs> um, but you know, I, I think that's what Connor, I, I don't know, Obviously, we had other influences, but we were each other's like uh, cheerleaders, um, yeah. hype girls, kind yeah. of yes. hype men, kind of thing. And so, I mean, I don't even know if I really would have gone into comics if I hadn't met them, to be honest. <laughs> um, so, okay. Yeah. So, um, so now I want to talk about your work, and I know that. Um, so. The work that you were doing earlier, there was narratives, but it was oblique. Everything was sort of like meant to be like a fragment from a world, like an object. 
sort of, or that's not like a, not to be speak to generally. Um, and then things became like more and more narrative and more comics-y, I would say. Um, but I also just want to talk to everyone about different narrative approaches or like, because, because some of your work, uh, and by some of your work, I mean some of you <laughs> uh, make work that uh, is more straightforward and it seems like it comes from a place of like, oh, I have this story in my mind, I want to tell it, or with Ryan and you're like sort of, I guess, is cover versions mean? Is cover versions somehow? No, it's like, pretty right. Yeah. Um, so I just want to talk about engaging with narrative or just like how you think of stories and then how you think of comics and how you think of the formal elements, like the, not the order that those elements come from, but yeah, just like narrative techniques. Well, um, one thing that, um, one thing that affected how I thought about like comics or stories is like when we were in school, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not about saying that like, it's not good to do comics in college in a fine arts degree. Like, that's not the point. But it's sort of like, yeah, like, you know, if you make a comic and you spend, like, a long time on it, it's a pretty small thing. So I felt like we, I felt like I wanted to be more object-oriented in what I was doing in school and less, like, comics-oriented. Like, less, like, just a story and, like, put it in a book. Like, there had to be some, like, physical thing about it. Like, why, like, w what is it going to be for for the reader, or for the viewer. Um, and so for that reason, like, it was something, like, you could sort of, like, place... I, I felt like I could, you know... If, like, design an object and yeah. then create a sort of story that fits the object. Yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. there was that gem cave thing, yeah. which was, like, you know, a physical toy, but an ex it's like an... Ex like, the comic was just, like, on the outside. Yeah. I don't know, <laughs> just, like, just doing a story and then not thinking about what kind of object it would be, like, what kind of end what kind of meaning it would have for the person. Like, that was weird. It was yeah. important to think about why somebody would pick it up, which also had to do with SPX, sort of, and, like, trying to sell work in person. Right. Um, yeah, I also feel like, like, very early on, we were, um, like, looking through the old uh, Fort Thunder website where they had, like, all of Multiforce cataloged and, like, all yeah. of this stuff. And, like, it was perfectly timed to where we were, like, I'm interested in making comics. And then you, like, see this thing, and it's so elemental that... Mm. It was like it seemed very, it was like the Ramones or something, you know? Like you can, like, oh, I can do that, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I, um, but like Molly's stuff was already like really, like coming into school, you were making these prints that were like parts of stories. And I feel like that's like your, your narrative approach seems to be like, like, um, like, like you don't get like a line, you get like, like it's like, um, it's like a tr like a weird train that's missing cars or something, and then you and then like your work is like putting it together rather than like yeah. s rather than like moving someone from like the caboose to the to the to the uh, engine. It's yeah, more like going. it's more like uh, Does you know. Describe Snowpiercer. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I wrote Snowpiercer. No, yeah. I think it's, she's not like it's not like Snowpiercer. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was just I, I you know I can talk a good game I could make a word salad and and like getting into comics I you know I'm so attracted to words and, and um, images and it was just really hard for me to like make a consistent narrative so yeah I was making objects from worlds that I was writing and everyone would be like but what's the story and I'd be like oh no no, no it's all up there it's coming out it's coming out 2000 10 <laughs> blockbuster <laughs> summer weekend but and then i slowly like had to i it, it would just get so overwhelming that i just needed to like make things from it so um that's a that's like a nine foot drawing by the way yeah so um, yeah that's a mall <laughs> <laughs> right and so the new stuff the stuff you've been doing more recently which let's just uh, so this is a giant image of a mall, which is like the setting of the last couple of comics. Yeah, um, this kind of... Although not necessarily the same mall. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's the universal uh, mall. It's uh, a town, town, town Center. Towson uh, Town Center. <laughs> <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I guess like to... Uh, 
focus in more. I just, now m the environment is less important and I'm trying to focus more on characters in the newer work. Um, and so now the backdrop is just the mall. You never really know where or when everything happens in the mall. There's a hospital in the mall. There's um, dogs, clowns, segways, and it's okay. <laughs> So this is an image uh, that you did in collaboration with Chris Day, who's sitting up front. But don't raise your hand. Um, I just want to <laughs> don't announce yourself. Just don't. Just um, don't. <laughs> but I want to talk about, because um, so you've done collaborative drawings. Uh, I guess mostly they're show posters. You've, Molly's done work with Chris at least this one time and with <laughs> Noel at least twice. For yeah. like just this last weekend. Yeah, just yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I want to talk. And... Um, so Connor, you also wrote a book, or not a book, a strip in CCC9 that Lane drew. Yeah. So I sort of want to talk about like what you get out of collaborating in this way where like what you're seeing in the other, what do you see in your peers' work that you specifically want to engage in and maybe like bring back to your own work? Or like if you're drawing something like this, how do you like view your styles as meshing or contrasting or like how you view them as like cohering and those like the uh, areas of intersectionality between you as artists as you like go further and further down your own path um well for me with uh like doing that collaboration with lane um that actually i feel like the seed of that started in brian ralph's class where like we we actually had to like write a comic and have someone else draw it and to draw someone else's comic and i found that to be really fun because i feel like um it's like so slow to get like I get very excited about like a story and then it's so slow to like have it realized that it was like really nice to just be like, oh, I thought of the story and then like, oh, now it's real like it like someone made it. And I think Lane is so like Lane is really he's like a super fast draftsman like he can like really churn out pages. And so I feel like that worked really well together where we were able to just like make this comic in like two weeks in like almost no time. Um, but yeah, I don't know, like, we used to sit around and, like, do, like, jam drawings and stuff like that for posters and stuff, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It, it kind of, like, uh, gives you less ownership of the piece, and, like, you can hand it to someone and trust that they can destroy it or make it better or, I don't know, it's a nice, like, freeing exercise to not get too attached to the way things look, because it comes back and you're like, well, ooh, <laughs> or like, yeah, hey, you know, <laughs> so it's, it's nice. Okay, so these are uh, pages from Strip Mall, which are the thing you're working on now uh, that I think are like pretty gorgeous. But um, I guess, Thanks, Brian. but uh, but here's where I'm going with that. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> don't get too proud of yourself, O'Connell. Um, no, um, oh, what's interesting so uh, is that you all engage with color differently, like. Uh, when I see these pages, I guess because of like the se the specific like sheen of their brightness, I'm thinking a lot about like ceramic glaze. Stop it. Okay. Keep well, going. I mean that's like a thing you do. That's like <laughs> that's a, a thing I do. Um, mm -hmm. And Connor's stuff is maybe like the most naturalistic approach to color, and it's sort it's a it's painterly, but also. Um, I was thinking a lot of uh, something that you've like returned to again and again is like landscape. Like when I first met you, uh, you had done this book called The Spirit World, which was like a CMYK book of uh, like still frames of just the woods from horror movies. And I remember not understanding why you would do that because it seemed like a lot of work for something that like wouldn't be fun. You told me that you got like carpal tunnel really bad. Um, <laughs> and Noel's approach to color is, I feel like it's, uh, it's more about shape and texture overlaying. Um, and then Ryan's stuff is more flat, uh, maybe more in keeping with like uh, the rhizo. Um, and as I say this, it occurs to me that this is not a question, uh, <laughs> but just a general observation. But if you want to talk about color or form or uh, shape 
and just um, <laughs> any of the Whoa. elements of art line. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Or... Just drop, just drop some fucking knowledge bombs. <laughs> I I don't know. I struggle with color. Like I, I recently having done like some color stuff. Like uh, I I always have to redo stuff all the time because. I kind of can't decide between doing like the local color thing or making it more of a, uh, making it more of like a mood thing or something like that. Like I feel like I go back and forth between those two things. Is that why the, like, because you've been doing a lot of watercolor paintings, but they're, yeah. you're basically viewing all of that as like sketchbook work, essentially. It's something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and those are pretty like those are pretty loose in terms of like the way color is used, but. Uh, yeah, just, I don't know, I'm just trying to figure it out. I don't know if I have a Well, coming clear. from uh-huh. coming from like screen printing and, and planning color um, in layers and form, which I always hated, but like did, you know, seep into my little brain. Working in these, I like kind of approach it like a screen print, like they're done in layers. And so it's funny that like, Ah, uh, that. Well, I don't know. It it was it changed like how I saw and used color, and it feels very natural. But I still have to do it in this layered process. Um, yeah, it's funny. I feel like when I, lately, like I've been doing sort of the opposite thing, where I have such trouble like act like doing the color separations in my mind that like like with the dormitory, those are all like watercolors that I then like color separated afterwards. And I feel like I'm always wanting to do that like. I just want to make like something where I can see how it's all going to be and then like do mm. the like make it graphic afterwards or something. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I remember I remember something that Molly did in screen prints like in the very beginning like was um that I just didn't expect and sort of like, you know, kind of kind of blew my mind. <clears throat> like you do like these like, you know, like one traditional thing in screen printing is like to do blocks of color and then like black line art, but you just do like line drawings on top of each other and like unexpected colors. And um, that was like a kind of approach to color, which uh, I just never even thought about doing. And yeah. I think like a lot, sometimes like, you know, you'll do things that are like the big purple book, or was it a green book? The giant book. Preguntas. 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 It's purple. Yeah. Mm. There's different there's P- editions. There's different was the big editions green that one. are different colors. Yeah, I just saw, it's so, it was so beautiful in the way you'd have like line art and like um, like handwriting and like small decorations, like just interacting around each other and not like mixing colors, but just like layering them around each other, but never making an effort to like enclose a shape around something else. Um, uh, yeah, I don't know how that, how to fix your paintings and stuff now, but you know that was cool. I, I mean, I, yeah, I think it's just a process you get used to and then bleeds into. I, I just got really psyched about like, oh, yeah, I can make color comics. I don't have to make, just for budget concerns, I was always doing black and white and then printing yeah, on color yeah. paper. Color paper is not cheap. And so <laughs> why not just draw in color? And uh, it's been like, an, I think it's totally changed like this new body of work and it's been really freeing. Color's great. Okay. <laughs> um, so uh, the end. Good. Good job, Brian. <laughs> <laughs>